you very much for inviting me. I've been associated with Dublin Bay all my life, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about my own particular interest there. Well, um, I'd like to just say at the beginning that um, this is about nature in general. It's not just about birds, it's about the whole ecosystem of Dublin Bay. And I, I'm going to try and uh, give you a kind of a broad um, understanding of how the system works. Birds are a big feature, and I think you, they'll come into the story at various stages. Um, but because this is the um, association for gaff rig sailing, um, I thought I'd just start with um, my own uh, beginnings in sailing, which was with my father in the 1960s in um, an IDRA 14 called DACE. And uh, this is not DACE, but it's a very similar boat. And I remember my father uh, winter after winter uh, scraping down the hull and uh, varnishing and painting and so on. So I know exactly what's involved in um, maintaining a wooden boat. Um, and later years, my father um, bought uh, an old wooden boat called um, a Hilliard, which, of which um, there are many different shapes and sizes. Um, the first ones were made in um, the south of England in about 100 years ago in 1920s. Um, and this is a picture of my father in the um, central cockpit of, uh, of his boat, Marden, uh, uh, which was acting as the flagship for the uh, centenary of the water wags in Dunleary that year. And then he, um, he cruised quite a bit in that boat, um, including uh, going to the, um, the centenary of the Clyde Cruising Club in um, Scotland, where he met up with other Hilliards. And you can see here uh, from left, uh, an English boat, a Scottish boat, and then um, my father's boat from Dublin Bay. So, um, you know, I have a long association with sailing in Dublin Bay, and um, my father would be 101 now if he, he was still alive, but uh, he did continue to sail into his early 90s, which um, gives me some encouragement. Um, <clears throat> my father grew up in uh, Sandy Mount, just one street away from the shoreline, and um, he was very familiar with the sea and he learned to swim here in the old um, baths, the old swimming baths off Sandy Mount uh, Promenade, which of course are ruined now, but um, at that time were filled with tidal water um, every day. Um, and he didn't move far. He, he moved from there to um, Dean's Grange and from there to Dunleary. And that was as far as he ever went in his life, apart from going around the world with the Navy. Um, but going back a little bit further, um, his grandfather, who was my great grandfather, was um, a George Ivor Nairn, and he was quite a, a, a competent artist. And he uh, painted and uh, sketched all his life. And this is just a sample of some of the craft, the sailing craft that he, um, he drew in at Dublin Bay, in this case at Rings End. And I think Cormac will, uh, would probably be able to tell you exactly what each of those uh, ships was, but we won't delay for the moment, Cormac. You can tell us at the end. Um, so that's about it uh, for sailing. Uh, and I'm going to move on to the nature aspects. And of course that's prompted by the book, which uh, Cormac mentioned, uh, published in 2017. And it's uh, still available in the shops. Uh, in some shops or online. <clears throat> and what I'd like to talk to you about tonight is, is uh, leaving aside the history uh, to focus in on the origins, uh, the habitats, um, and some of the wildlife that uh, we find in the Bay. Um, and then look a little bit at uh, what uh, its future is, you know, um, what kind of uh, threats there are to the Bay uh, in the longer term. Um, so just going back to the end of the last ice age, and this is a photograph, an aerial photograph from a part of the Canadian coast. It gives you some idea of how Dublin Bay might have looked like um, after the ice receded and woodland stretched right down to the shoreline. Um, 
<clears throat> there wouldn't have been modern developments, of course, but um, there would have been uh, extensive uh, sand flats and probably a delta of the River Liffey. Um, and we know now that uh, sea level was a lot lower at that stage, um, 10,000 years ago. If you look halfway along the graph, you can see it was 20 meters below present sea level. So all of the present Dublin Bay would have been land at that time, uh, probably um, a flat marshy area. And this is a, a uh, artist impression of what that might have looked like. So uh, the present Dublin city there is somewhere between the Dodder and the Talca. Um, and the, you can see Dawkey on the left, um, or the promontory of Dawkey. Um, but Dunleary and all of that would have been in an area of marshland, which was kind of flat uh, uh, delta area um, fed by the rivers um, with maybe lines of sand dunes on the outside, uh, which are thrown up from the Irish Sea. So th that just gives you some concept of how much the sea has, how much the bay has changed in a few thousand years. And of course, the early settlers only came around that time, nine to 10,000 years ago, the first encampments would have been on the coast. So this evening, I'm going to talk about the bay in really sort of three sections. Um, and the broad habitat types would be divided into the marine area, which is um, quite shallow, only, um, only down to the 10 meter uh, depth contour, um, which is the light blue color there. And, um, and then the intertidal area, which is um, between high and low watermarks, which is of course covered twice a day. And then the coastland areas, um, which are immediately adjacent to the coast, but you know, clearly maritime in character. Um, so I'll start with the marine area and <clears throat> We'll all be familiar with uh, the common compass jellyfish, and there are uh, many other types of jellyfish um, uh, which come into the bay, um, often driven in by uh, south or so southeasterly winds, as the bay is opening to the southeast, um, and uh, the jellyfish are uh, floating, pushed along by the wind and the tides. Um, they very often get trapped in the bay, and it's one of the reasons why we get concentrations of uh, jellyfish, um, all of which should be avoided because they all have some sting or other, um, but some are much worse than others. On the bed of the bay, then on the seabed, <clears throat> there's a huge, are huge masses of this uh, worm called the sand mason worm, which um, is tiny, but it is half buried in the sand and the uh, top end, which you can see there, the tentacles are sticking up into the, into the water column and uh, trapping particles of uh, food from the currents. Um, and in order to uh, make themselves more resistant to being eaten by fish and other uh, marine life, uh, they coat, they stick uh, sand grains onto their um, onto their tentacles, so it makes them kind of less digestible. Um, but at times when there are big onshore storms, um, large quantities of this uh, worm get washed ashore, and these tubes, these um, sandy tubes, are cast up on the tide line, and I'm sure many of you will be familiar with those. Um, the fisheries in Dublin Bay are very interesting history, um, and Cormac knows a lot about this, but all you have to do is go into the Natural History Museum on um, Marion Square and look into the cabinets on left and right on the ground floor, and you'll see some incredible specimens that were caught in Dublin Bay, in, mostly in the uh, 19th century, and presented to, first of all, to Trinity College, and then uh, casts were made and presented to the museum. And some of these are colossal. I mean, that... Uh, place and the main screen there is about 80 centimeters long. The bar at the bottom is divided into 10 centimeter units. Um, whereas the, the one in the top left is a modern place on a dinner plate uh, for, for, for scale. So the, the one at the bottom would have filled the dinner table. Um, and there were many other species as well in Dublin Bay that were caught commonly like turbot and uh, sharks and so on, which don't occur there now or not are very rare. <clears throat> 
in the Bay. So things have changed radically since um, over the last 200 years due to essentially fishing pressure, really. Um, <clears throat> there are, of course, still plays, but uh, they tend to be fairly small. Here's a gray seal. That's one which uh, it's caught uh, on, the, on the shallow sandy bottom. And then there are occasionally larger uh, bottom dwelling, um, more predatory fish like the, the, the rays, which um, swim in among the seaweed and, and uh, catch other uh, fish and, and marine animals. But it's the shoaling fish that we're mostly familiar with, the, um, the, the large shoals of sand eels, which, uh, which swim into the bay in the summer and um, which spawn in the sandy uh, bottom in particularly where the sand is soft and lay their eggs there. Uh, and then, of course, we're all familiar with the mackerel, which um, uh, uh, tend to come in smaller numbers these days than they used to. I can remember going out uh, off um, Bullock Harbour and, and coming in with sacks full of mackerel in the summer as a, as a, as a young lad. Uh, nowadays, you know, you'd be lucky to bring a few dozen home. Um, but they do, they do come in in shells, and I've seen them actually jumping out onto the rocks in places uh, when, when they're chasing sprat and so on. Uh, pretty impressive. Uh, and of course, they're important um, uh, food source for many of the other wildlife species, one of which is the harbour porpoise. And um, Dublin Bay actually has um, one of the highest densities of, of harbour porpoises uh, in Ireland. Um, and this photograph taken looking back from um, the Burford Bank towards Dunleary in the background there, you can see the seafront of Dunleary. Um, and uh, it's very common to see them, particularly around the um, headland, the Hoth Head and Ireland's Eye and that sort of area, because they, um, there's a fast moving tide there and they seem to uh, trap fish there easier than they would out in the open bay. Usually they just surface once or twice and then they dive and they are scared of boats, so they, they'll swim away from boats, unlike dolphins, which tend to swim towards the boats and are attracted by them. So that's what they look like. They're a bit different. They're small. They're only um, uh, maybe three to four foot long um, and tend to stay underwater a lot of the time. Uh, and here's the sand eels, which they're um, catching in the bay. Uh, they swim after the shoals and, and, and catch them by the beakful, I guess. So among the other mammals, then, of course, we have seals in Dublin Bay, um, both gray seals as here, um, mostly at Dorky Island, um, some around Hoth Head and, and Ireland's Eye, and occasionally up on the Bull Island as well. Um, they haul out of the water, usually at, um, at low tide, and then when the tide uh, rises, they float off and uh, go, go feeding. Um, occasionally a pup is born. Um, often they get disturbed, of course, because the white-coated pups are um, land bound for the first three weeks. They can't, well, they can swim, but they can't swim very effectively. And so they stay on, on the shore and they're fed by the mothers. Uh, mothers come ashore several times a day and feed them. Um, so few pups survive in Dublin Bay really because of the amount of people and pressure and, and disturbance there is from dogs and, and the like. Um, uh, most of the pups that you would see uh, in Dublin Bay were born on uh, places like Lamb Bay and uh, Ireland's Eye, or even further afield, actually, in the, the, the Salties off Wexford is an important breeding place. And then we also have the harbour seal. Um, best place to see them is the north tip of the Bull Island, even looking across from Sutton um, with, a, with a, a pair of binoculars, you can see them clearly lying on the sand there. The difference is quite marked between the two. The harbour seal is small, about the size of a, a dog, really, with a sort of dog-like face. Um, the um, grey seal is, uh, the bulls are twice as big, um, big, heavy animals with long, long nose. And you'll notice that the, the spotting on the fur is different as well. On the harbour seal, it's much more finely spotted. On the grey seal, it's big blotches. Um, so look out for those two features if you do see seals. And they're often mixed. You'll see them at Bull Island. You'll get both species together. So I'll, I'll just move on to the intertidal area then, which is the uh, yellow area on the map, which um, is between high and low watermark. And these are all the well-known um, parts of the intertidal area. Uh, 
Um, and it's a huge area, you know, about uh, 2,000 hectares or 5,000 acres of uh, land. You could call it land, wetland is exposed at each low tide. Um, and the widest bits being at Sandy Man Strand there where it's um, up to two kilometers wide. Um, and it, it's some experience to be uh, caught out on one of those sandbanks at low tide or as on a rising tide. Um, typically you'll find large uh, beds of the lugworm out on near the low water mark, um, usually given away by the casts. Um, these aren't the worms themselves, but they're just the, um, the sand that it's been uh, feeding on during the day, the wet sand that it pushes back up to the surface in these casts. And this tells you where the um, back end of the burrow is. The burrow is a U-shape and uh, the mouth of the worm is at one end of the U and the tail is at the other end. And, and at the tail end, they push up this, um, this uh, pile of, of, of sand, basically. Uh, so that's the lugworm. Um, and it's, of course, the favorite target of the bait diggers because they're, they're looking for them for, um, for ang sea angling. Uh, among other things, ragworms as well, of course, and, and other bait. But uh, on the sand, then you get a, a whole range of other um, shellfish or remains of shellfish. Uh, and this is one of the best places to find them is at uh, Marion Gates. They're just uh, where the sand dunes have started to build up. Uh, there's a huge uh, deposit of um, empty shells. And uh, like I think, um, uh, in Ulysses, James Joyce wrote about Stephen uh, crunching uh, shells on the shore of Sandy Mount. Uh, you can still do that today, uh, walking among uh, the razor shells and, and other things. And you can see in the middle of that uh, picture there, that group, um, the sand mason worm casts, which are I, I mentioned earlier, which are washed ashore during storms. Um, so, of course, uh, the, the shellfish and the worms and so on attract uh, large numbers of birds. And Dublin Bay, the intertidal parts of Dublin Bay are enormously important uh, for wintering um, and indeed summering birds, but particularly wintering. And uh, they fall into a number of sort of well-known groups. So you have the waders, the ones with the long legs and the long beaks. Uh, you have the wildfowl, particularly Brent geese, huge numbers um, in Dublin Bay. Uh, ducks and swans and so on to some degree, but uh, geese would be the most, uh, the most important. We have seabirds, um, a whole range of different species, maybe up to 20 seabird species, but uh, in this case, um, one of the terns, um, which are um, very prominent from now on. We have sandwich, plenty of sandwich terns in at the moment uh, and more different species due to come in the next uh, week or two. Uh, then there are lots of other birds, which maybe people don't know so well. The grebes, um, uh, you'll see plenty of those in the Liffey Channel and the Tolka Estuary and so on. Uh, herons like the, um, the egret, this is the little egret, which is a relative newcomer in, in the bay, maybe in the last 20 years. Um, maybe is more of those now than grey herons even. Um, and then the divers, which are spectacular. They're generally offshore, but you will occasionally see them in the Lift, Liffey Channel, um, but uh, uh, sometimes in groups in winter, um, the red-throated uh, diver and great northern diver as well. So um, an enormous range and numbers of birds can be up in the range of sort of uh, 40 to 50,000 birds in winter. Um, if you include all the gulls, I've left the gulls out there, but gulls would be the, among the most numerous. And they come from all over the globe, or at least all over the um, northern half of the globe. Um, <clears throat> the Brent geese come the furthest, really, from Arctic Canada. Um, there's quite a few uh, species of the waders, in particular, coming from Greenland and Iceland, uh, often stopping off in Iceland en route to, to Ireland in the uh, autumn months. Uh, that's a knot, incidentally, with the red... Uh, the red um, plumage. And then from the east we get, um, uh, but also from Iceland, we get uh, oyster catchers uh, from Scandinavia and uh, from Scotland as well. Lots of Scottish breeding oyster catchers come into Ireland, into Ireland and particularly Dublin Bay. And then from Siberia, birds like the godwish, which can fly uh, non-stop for 10,000 kilometers um, in a few days, no problem. Uh, but it, it uh, 
it has to build its body weight, of course, to do that because it's, it's, it's fueling on its own body uh, without any stop for food. And then in summer, we have the, um, the terns coming into us from West Africa and further, further south as well. Some of them, the Arctic tern comes from um, further south in Africa um, and other seabirds as well, less common um, than those. So you can see um, Dublin Bay is kind of a, like a crossroads in the migration routes um, and uh, birds are moving in and out all of the time. Um, lots of short trips as well up and down the East Coast and um, uh, across the Irish Sea into um, Scottish estuaries and, and bays as well. So um, it's, it's really a hub, you know, like an international airport for the birds. So why are they here? Well, they're here to feed primarily. Uh, to survive, I guess, um, through, the, through the, the year, through the winter months, uh, before they go back to breed. And they have to be in really excellent condition like this godwit to make those long uh, migration flights to places like Siberia. Um, so uh, birds like, familiar birds like the curlew, um, we have very few nesting curlews left in Ireland, only a handful, but um, the curlews that we get are probably mostly coming in from the continent uh, and from Scandinavia. Um, and they're feeding up in Dublin Bay before they go back to breed. So where is the food? Because a lot of people look out at the, the sand flats in Dublin Bay and say, well, wh what's attracting them? Because this doesn't appear to be anything there. But you just have to put a spade into the, into the sand and dig a hole and uh, you'll find exactly what they're looking for. Um, and the birds with the longest bills, like curlew, can um, reach down to the lugworms, which are in um, burrows that are maybe uh, 10 centimeters deep. Um, whereas a little bird like the ring plover on the left there is just picking shells off the surface or just below the surface. Um, and of course, the others are intermediate in, in, in bill length. So it means that they're not actually competing with each other. They, each one has a different uh, sort of range of of foods that it's it's targeting and they can quite happily feed in the same area but targeting different foods and then as the tide rises they they have to leave the sand flats and move into these big um, uh, concentrations that we call roosts um, high tide roosts and they can stay there for four three four hours over the high tide period usually about sort of two hours before and two hours after um, uh, depending on the tidal cycle, whether it's springs or neaps. Um, and uh, there they're resting, they're uh, cleaning their feathers. Um, they don't really sleep uh, as we do, but they, uh, they, I guess they'll take 40 winks and then look up to see is there any danger. Um, but also they're digesting the food, of course, that they've been um, eating more or less continuously during, uh, during the low tide period. Um, but the important thing is that there's kind of safety in numbers. And um, it's like um, if a danger approaches, whether it be um, a dog or a bird of prey or something, uh, one of the birds is bound to be watching and will um, spook the rest and they, they will fly. Um, and they, they can fly around for maybe 10 minutes before they settle back in again. So the Brent geese then um, spend um, a lot of their time initially when they arrive in um, September, October on the sand flats, um, in particular places like at Marion Gates, where there's a big, um, big bed of um, uh, gr grass called eelgrass uh, on the shoreline. And this attracts the geese because it has a very high protein content. And they consume this quite quickly by about November, it's all gone. And they start to move inland. So they, they move on to the uh, coast of grasslands, like here at uh, Clontar. Um, and um, they'll also come in at high tide, of course, each day when, when the uh, shoreline is covered um, and feed intensively on the gra short grass, particularly um, uh, just like domestic geese do uh, before flying back out again. They're quite tolerant of disturbance. So people can walk within. 10, 20 meters quite up and they, they'll continue feeding. It's only when a dog appears that they, um, they get spooked and, and fly. So you can see already that there's a kind of very complex system of uh, food web, as we call it, uh, in the bay where uh, everything is based, I guess, on, on green plants and uh, phytoplankton, which is a plant uh, floating in the sea. 
and um, uh, on that you have um, things feeding directly like the fish and the, um, the zooplankton and, and that's feeding um, a, both the, the uh, carnivores like birds and fish and um, worms um, and also, and that's of course feeding the top predators like the seals and the um, por porpoise and, and birds like peregrine falcon, which are, are picking off some of these smaller birds. So uh, there's a complex sort of web of, of food um, and with one thing dependent on another. And, and it really does underline the fact that if, if one element of that uh, complex jigsaw is, is taken out, it affects everything else. And uh, we really need to be aware of that when um, considering things like overfishing, for instance. So um, moving on up then through the um, sort of uh, the, the shoreline, uh, we come to salt marsh, which is strictly speaking is intertidal because it's covered occasionally by the highest tide. So it's not covered by every tide, but um, but uh, in the tidal cycle, it's certainly covered on a number of days uh, each, each cycle, uh, each month. And um, it, at the very lowest part of the salt marsh, you have the, what we call the pioneer area, which is made up mostly of this plant, samphire. Uh, um, uh, it's like little cactus, really, when you look at it closely, but without the spines. And um, it's, you can see this actually now in quite a few delicatessens for sale, although I don't think it comes from Dublin Bay, but um, uh, it is it is quite nice to eat if you like that kind of thing. It's good and salty, um, and this is a lovely at, at Marion Gates, which um, is is developing very nicely into a piece of wild salt marsh. And then, if you go to the Bull Island on the north side, you'll see a really extensive area of well developed salt marsh, which has been there, of course, for about two hundred years. Um, and has grown and grown and grown as the um, sand accumulates and the, the mud, mud uh, silts up there. Um, and uh, this is one of the finest examples of, of salt marsh on the East Coast um, in still in a fairly, uh, fairly pristine condition, uh, with one exception, and that is that there's a plant here called cord grass. Uh, it's hard to see in that photograph because um, it's all the same color as the background, but um, it's, it's tall, it's spiky uh, in appearance. And this is an introduced plant, which uh, is actually a hybrid between two other introduced plants that, was, that were brought in here in the 1920s and planted in long straight lines in order to, um, I guess, reclaim the salt marsh and turn it into dry land. Um, for what purpose, I'm not sure, but uh, it's, it's taken hold and it's spread. And you can see actually to the, in the top right of that picture, you can see quite a big stand of, of cord grass um, uh, throughout the salt marsh. The hares um, also favored the salt marsh, uh, partly because it's, it's, it's wide open space with no, uh, no cover for predators um, such as dogs or foxes. But um, unfortunately, the population has declined and declined and declined. And I, I believe there are no hares seen there. I mean, I'm, I'm subject to correction if anybody has seen a hare recently there. But the numbers are much smaller than they used to be. Um, and I think there's some evidence that uh, harassment by dogs is, is a factor. Um, I, incidentally, I have a dog myself, so I'm, you know, I'm not a totally anti-dog person, but uh, in this context, dogs off the lead chasing hares is not a, not a great um, a solution to the problem. This area at Bootestown Marsh, of course, used to be salt marsh as well on the south side of the bay until it was cut off from the bay, from the tide, by the railway line um, in the mid 1800s, um, 1830s possibly, I'm not sure exactly the date of the, this was the first railway line in out of, out of Dublin city, you could say to, to Kingstown as it was then. And um, the, this inlet of Dublin Bay was cut off from the tide, but there, there was a tunnel left and uh, a culvert with uh, the tide passing through it and a, um, a uh, valve uh, put on it, a flat valve that closed at, uh, at high tide. So um, what the situation we have now is that um, it fills on a high tide and it holds the water much longer than the bay outside. So 
um, at high tide, at, as the tide is dropping out on uh, Marion Strand, uh, it's retained inside here and you have the birds roosting on the islands um, through, through that period. Uh, and it's a really good place to, to get close to the birds. If you walk along the rock road there and just peep through the trees, you'll see big flocks of red shank and um, godwits and, and dunlin and other birds like, um, like the uh, little egret. Of course, rocky shores are also part of the intertidal um, because they're covered by the tide um, most, the, most days. Um, and uh, Sandy Cove is a good example of that. Um, I, I learned to swim there as a, a nipper, so uh, I, I do remember the slippery rocks um, as, you, as you went into the sea. Uh, in fact, my parents lived overlooking this view for their last few years. Um, so here, of course, the, um, the rocks are often covered in a real blanket of brown seaweeds of the rack, the various different uh, rack brown seaweeds. Um, and there are certain animals that specialize in this habitat, such as the shore crabs, the, the, lots of little crabs in underneath the uh, seaweed. And then those are hunted by um, specialist rocky shore birds like turnstones that spend a lot of time flipping over the weed or flipping over little stones, as their name suggests, looking for uh, small marine creatures that they can eat. So just moving on then to some of the, what I call coastlands, which are the sort of a coastal strip. Um, uh, and I'm going to particularly focus in on um, Bull Island, which I've mentioned, um, Hoth Head, uh, the two islands of Ireland's Eye and Dorky, Dorky Island, even though Ireland's Eye, I suppose, is strictly outside Dublin Bay, but it's linked with Hoth Head, so we'll give it honorary status. And, um, and Dublin Port as well, because it has some, some nature interest as well. So Dolly Mount Strand, as many people will know, is where a lot of courting is done. And you can see a couple here braving the wind and the, 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 the driving sand. Um, and, but it, it serves to illustrate what happens on a, a very on, wind, onshore wind uh, at low tide, that the, the wind picks up the, uh, the sand and sweeps it up into the sand dunes. And it's this plant, marum grass, which um, has the uh, amazing capacity to grow through uh, burying sand, sand that buries it up to a meter deep, and it can still grow quite vigorously and flower in those conditions. In fact, it does much better in um, mobile sand than it would do if there's no sand supply. And that grass and allied grasses are responsible for building the sand dunes of the Bull Island. Um, I won't go into the history, it's quite an interesting history of the development of Dublin Port followed by uh, movement of sand around the bay um, and then blowing of that sand up onto the dunes. Um, and we know the history of that quite well because it's, it's, it's captured in old maps. Um, but you have, um, there's also a, another plant called lime grass here, you can see it in the foreground. Um, and that has, does exactly the same, um, traps the sand in these embryo dunes, as they're known. And then if they survive the next winter, they become four dunes and uh, gradually the vegetation starts to build out towards the sea. And then very often there might be a big storm event one year and that sweeps it all the way back down to the beach again. So there's a kind of a cycle going on here. And there are some lovely plants in here as well. If you walk in among the four dunes, in the early summer, you'll see plants like sea bindweed and, and other very common sand dune plants just growing almost on bare sand. <clears throat> so, as I mentioned, um, the, we know the history of the Bull Island and from the old maps, we're able to actually work out uh, the age of the different parallel lines of dunes on the Bull Island, starting from the 1860s uh, right through to the most recent one in the 1980s. And I may be a bit out of date here, but um, uh, the, 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 the lines of dunes, particularly on the right hand side, on the eastern side of that picture, are quite obvious, uh, a little bit more confused in the golf courses, obviously, but um, nevertheless, there are uh, a dune ridges there that can be picked out. And the, really, the most natural area is right up at the northern end, close to Sutton, which is not golf course, but you can see the full sequence right the way across from shoreline to salt marsh. And then in that area, um, at the very northern end, 
uh, there are some dune slacks which are quite natural in dunes these are areas of wetter sand where the water table comes to the surface or indeed where the, the wind has blown away the sand down to the water table and you get a whole range of different plants here the, the blue in this picture is mostly made up of this plant the devil's bit scabious beautiful uh, blue color um, and here you have a, a wonderful array of orchids i've seen at times, you know, hundreds of spikes of this marsh helleborine and other orchids growing here. Um, and it's just a matter of growing at the right time of year. I think probably June, July is probably about the best time to go. Um, and then associated with all the wildflowers, you have a, a wonderful array of insects. Um, the marsh fritillary butterfly is quite a rare species in Europe, and it's, it's a fairly uh, plentiful here feeding actually its larva its caterpillars feed on the devil's bit scabies so that's why it's there in the first place and this bumblebee on the right is a rare one as well you won't find this in in your garden it's it's a rare species associated with sanders can you hear me yeah okay sorry um so just moving on quickly to um, Hoth Head and the familiar view from the Bailey um, with uh, County Wicklow in the background. And um, in the foreground, then we have this lovely area of uh, coastal heath with um, the heathers and the gorse uh, all in full flower in um, late summer. And uh, that's really the best time to see that. Um, and choose a nice warm sunny day and it's it's absolutely fantastic up there um, and most of the heather is is this species the ling heather which is uh, probably the commonest one in ireland actually although there are several other uh, heather species too um, the cliffs themselves are pretty substantial in places and and dangerous too i guess um, but spectacular to look at and it's worth looking in this picture at the different zones um, uh, up the up the the rock face from the water level you can see clearly the high tide mark with the straight line uh, and above that immediately above that the black band which is made of uh, is colored from a lichen um, a lichen or lichen that grows on the rock and then in the that's the kind of spray zone i suppose you call it where which is regularly uh, sprayed by waves and then you have the the kind of um uh, I suppose that's the wave zone and then you have a spray zone above that which gets uh, occasional spray which is has the orange or yellow lichen on it too so you can clearly before we get into the uh, green vegetation proper so there's a series of zones on most cliffs like that around the coast and then if you zoom in on this area um, it, you have a, quite a sizable colony of kittiwakes um, these are beautiful, delicate, small gulls, members of the gull family, but not the, like the big herring gull or blackback gulls. Um, these are mostly oceanic. They spend most of their lives out on the ocean, feeding far from land. And they only come to the cliffs for a very few months in the summer where they, they make these amazing structures, these nests, which are made just of seaweed and their own droppings, which they kind of cement to the cliff. Um, and they can almost um, stick them to vertical rock faces, which is incredible, and then lay, uh, lay two eggs in it and uh, incubate the chick, incubate the eggs there to uh, raise the chicks. So um, kittiwakes have declined quite significantly in recent years due mainly to overfishing. So I'll come back to that. Shags, you'll see there too, uh, distinguished from the cormorant by the, um, the uh, crest on the head during summer, um, uh, during the breeding season, and that bright yellow patch uh, just below the eye. Uh, they're much more delicate as well than, than, uh, than the big heavy cormorants, much smaller and uh, more uh, smaller, lighter looking. Um, so Ireland's eye, of course, not far away, and um, probably most people associate that with the gulls because the big colonies of, um, of two or three species of gulls there, the blackbacks and the herring gulls, um, and therein is a bit of a problem because with the large number of summer visitors, um, there's a bit of interaction between them and um, the gulls resent, I guess, people walking through their nesting areas in the, um, in the breeding season and they will uh, 
uh, try and chase the people off and chase dogs off and so on. There, there are incidents, shall we say, occurring each year. Um, and so um, Fingal County Council, who um, don't actually own the island, but um, do have uh, some uh, role in managing it, uh, commissioned me to prepare a management plan for the island um, a few years ago, which um, took into account all of the natural interests and the visitor numbers and, and various things, made a number of recommendations for improvements, including separating the uh, visitors a bit from the gold colonies by, by creating paths that would lead people away from them rather than through the gold, through the gold colonies. On the eastern end, then you have these spectacular cliffs and um, stacks or the kind of separated cliff, which is separated from the main island. And on that, we have a big colony of uh, gannets now. And it's, it's quite recent, really. It only started to develop, I think, in the 1980s and, and just a few pairs um, in, in the, after several decades. It's built up now to um, many hundreds of pairs. Um, they're quite um, impressive birds when you get up close and um, make a lot of noise as well. But they nest on these vertical cliffs, vir virtually, uh, virtually vertical, any ledge area. Um, I had to put this one in, of course, for the, for the gaffers among you. Um, the, the, a, a lovely um, a fleet of um, uh, host 17s coming around the end of um, Ireland's Eye underneath the Gannet colony. And uh, I just happened to be out in the boat that day and uh, got a nice shot of them. Um, the gannets dive, of course, vertically. I'm sure you've all seen them um, diving vertically for their food uh, or, or, at, or at an angle like this. Uh, they just fold the wings like an arrow and they go straight in, hardly making a splash and can, can um, come up with a beak full of fish such as herring or mackerel, uh, some of the larger shoaling fish that are near the surface. So then the other island, of course, is Doki Island, and um, this one uh, is known for a number of kind of nature interests, uh, more recently for the terns that are nesting there. Uh, and this is not without a lot of work by Birdwatch Ireland and the County Council as well to um, uh, clear rats off the island um, and to uh, fence off areas from other predators uh, so that the terns can get a safe nesting place, particularly on the small islets to the north of uh, the main island, but also on the uh, main island itself. And some of the other wildlife interests here, of course, are um, the seals, which I previously mentioned. And they seem to be quite um, happy to sit there and be photographed and, and uh, are not spooked by uh, boatloads of people um, arriving every day in the summer. Uh, the goats are a little bit more, um, shall we say, um, wary and will go to the far limits of the island and, and sit on the rocks um, or even right down by the, by the tide line uh, until people go home in the evening and then they come out and graze. And there are substantial numbers of people there. I spent, uh, I think it was three years ago, I spent uh, many days out there counting people um, and watching their activities. Um, and uh, I produced a management plan for Dunleary Rathdown Council, uh, which I'm not sure it's seen the light of day yet, but it's, um, it's certainly with the council. And um, the, um, the people mainly land there in the northwest corner uh, on the steps. And um, apart from canoes, some of the canoes land at other places. Um, and then they walk up to the church and to the Martello and often to the battlements at the southern end uh, and back down. And there's some people who actually never walk very far from the landing at all. They just sit down, have a picnic and then go back on the boat again. But uh, we, we, we installed um, uh, an automatic counter on the steps uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, the first full year we got was 2019. And you can see here a peak um, at the end of July of 547 people in that day. So the substantial numbers of people going out there um, with Ken Cunningham, who runs the ferry uh, uh, out to the island. I guess uh, in the last summer, it was pretty minimal with, uh, with restrictions on travel and so on. So finally, um, on the 
coast lands, I'll just mention Dublin Port because I've done quite a lot of uh, survey work in there um, for the port company. And uh, just this week, I was out actually uh, surveying guillemots, which I do from a boat going up along all the key walls. And we find about 40 pairs of guillemots nesting, mostly in these old uh, redundant drainage holes in the key walls, in the older parts of the key walls, sometimes under um, uh, ramps leading onto the uh, shipping, um, occasionally on wooden structures like uh, mooring dolphins and so on. Uh, so they're, they're quite uh, tame. You can, you can uh, go right up close to them and they're quite comical looking as well as they sit at the, the mouth of the drainage channels with their red feet and um, this classic uh, white patch on the wings. As you go up towards Poolbeg Marina, um, you pass by this old uh, uh, dolphin, uh, which belongs to the ESB, um, and I believe became redundant when the oil uh, importing was, was finished um, uh, there. And um, uh, it, was, it was then occupied by, um, by a turn colony, and this has grown and grown and grown until about 2017, when the wooden part, which you can see on the left there, um, collapsed into the sea um, after several storms. Uh, the bases of those uh, piers were rotten, their, their timber, and they were rotten, and uh, it began to collapse the previous year and then fell altogether, tipped over like the Titanic. Uh, into the sea and had to be removed um, so it wouldn't be a hazard to shipping and DSB subsequently built a new top on that uh, on that dolphin on which the terns have, have come back to nest so here's a here's a, a chick in summer this would be probably in late June July uh, and here's a juvenile and an adult together on one of the railings uh, the juvenile on the right with the kind of white uh, forehead but uh, to try and um, provide the terns with some alternative nesting sites, Dublin Port uh, mobilized um, a couple of large pontoons, which had been used for events like the, um, the tall ships uh, events, only very occasionally used. Uh, and these were modified by the addition of um, some wooden, wooden boards on the side and gravel uh, being put on the top which mimics, of course, the beaches that, uh, and islands that these terns would naturally nest on. And very quickly, from uh, about 2013, we put the first one out, uh, terns took to it. Um, and now there's a second one off the um, Great South Wall, which I'm sure many of you have seen as you sail up to Poolbeg Marina. Um, and uh, these are now, there are more terns nesting on these than there are on the other structures. So in total, there are, um, something approaching 600 pairs of uh, nesting terns every year on these four structures, most of them common terns, uh, a few Arctic terns as well um, in, are there. But they don't stay in the port all the time. In fact, they're flying constantly backwards and forwards out across the bay um, on trips to collect food. And mo the main most um, popular target is the Kish Bank, because um, when that's shallow, it's easy for them to catch fish um, by diving into the shallow water, uh, things like sand eels and uh, sprat and, um, and, 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 and herring, uh, which, which are brought back then to the nest, and they're flying back this distance every day, backwards and forwards. In the port itself, in winter, we get uh, Brent geese as well, which are, are attracted in here by spillages of um, animal foodstuffs which come off the ships and uh, they're, they're often spilt on the quaysides and the geese come in and guzzle that just like muesli or something um, uh, and seem to be able to put up with um, uh, most of the disturbance that's going on from the cranes and the, the, the port workers. Um, I'm going to draw to a close now but just to mention that um, birds in Dublin Bay live very close to people most of their lives and so they're used to us but within certain limits. Uh, this is a roost on uh, Sandy Mount Strand. You can see the, the um, chimneys, which you're never far away from in the background. Um, and this is on the north side, <clears throat> looking across to, um, to uh, Kilester, I think, or someplace like that, uh, with housing and Brent geese flying across above the houses. Um, and the birds are affected by disturbance. Um, they can put up with a certain amount, but um, 
when it becomes too intense with people walking across their roost sites, um, the birds will, will scatter. And I did a study a few years ago in uh, Irish town area, just um, in the corner of Sandy Man Strand. Um, for a whole winter, we looked at uh, the number of birds there and how many incidents of disturbance there were and what the reaction was. And we found that turnstones, which um, I mentioned earlier on rocky shores, but also feed in the muddy in, inner bay, um, they're disturbed three times more often than than some of the other birds like Brent geese because they're close to the top of the beach all the time and that's where people are mainly. But the Brent geese, when they're disturbed, they take twice as long to return to feeding. So uh, you could argue that um, the effect on Brent geese is bigger than the effect on, on turnstones. Um, it's hard to say, but uh, definitely there is a constant effect of disturbance, particularly in good weather when there are large numbers of people on the beach at low tide. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, the main effects are from dogs. So you can get, um, you know, 100 people there and the birds will continue to feed, but one dog off the lead and they're all gone um, in, in a flash and uh, it'll be a while before they come back. Um, but recent, um, you know, other activities like kite surfing here can have short term impact. So we, we studies have shown that when kites are, kites are around uh, flying along the shoreline that uh, uh, only about half the birds are present uh, compared with when they're not there. So um, there is an impact here and I won't go into the details. So Birdwatch Ireland have been undertaking um, a major study in Dublin Bay for the last almost a decade now um, uh, to not only to count and map the birds, but also to mark them. And this is um, the roost at uh, Marion Gates where um, quite a large number of waders have been trapped uh, by netting and under license, I should say, um, and fitted with these um, colored rings. So if you get close to an oyster catcher, check its legs and you can see, you can actually read the, 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 the ring number, which is JH on this one. Um, and that, uh, that allows them to, um, to trace the, the movements of the birds, both within Dublin Bay, so we know exactly where that bird is, is feeding throughout the winter, and then back on its breeding grounds. And many of them have been, um, many of them been recited in places like Scotland and Iceland uh, in subsequent summers. But the seabirds as well have been studied, well studied. Here are some shags roosting on the Kish Light uh, <clears throat> Lighthouse offshore. And you can see them flying off to the right as I approached. Um, and by marking some of these with um, satellite tags on, on Lambay, in this case, uh, there's quite a big colony on Lambay, you can see that they all made a beeline for uh, the Kish Bank where, where they're feeding. And again, it's the shallow water that attracts them there, um, uh, and the ease of catching fish in, in shallow waters over sand. We, we've done some surveys of seabirds um, with Dublin Port and, and they kindly provided one of their pilot boats to do this on the channels and uh, out to the uh, Dublin Bay buoy. Um, and we used the, the top deck of the pilot boat as a vantage point to, uh, to count the seabirds and to, to map them. Um, just in terms of threats, well, we've all heard about the water pollution that does happen from time to time, usually in winter, uh, this is the outlet from the um, uh, pool, bag, um, uh, pool bag treatment works, um, and it always grabs the headlines, um, but uh, I guess that without the treatment works, it'd be a lot worse, and they are upgrading it now um, so that it's going to remove a lot of the really nasty stuff um, so that hopefully in future uh, things will look a bit better, but that sort of situation hopefully shouldn't occur again. But climate change is really the main threat to the bay. And it's not just coastal flooding, but um, you know, we're looking at uh, at least a meter rise in sea level in the next uh, 80 years or so. And uh, it seems like this are become, gonna become uh, very regular uh, with onshore winds and, and uh, spring tides, high pressure situations. And, and possibly our grandchildren might even be seeing scenes like this in the city centre. Um, uh, hopefully um, there's nobody in that bus, probably uh, it's just parked there. Um, 
the other factor is the increasing frequency of, of large storm events like this one at Bullock Harbor. Uh, I can't give you a date on this one, but you can see it's a massive onshore storm. This guy's risking his life here to save his boat on the pier. Um, and the combination of a you know, meter sea level rise, increased uh, storm surges um, is going to give us <clears throat> what's known as coastal squeeze. Um, in other words, the um, uh, low watermark is going to be pushed up towards the high watermark. And, and of course, around most of Dublin Bay, there's no possibility that the high watermark can move inland because of the hard, uh, hard uh, um, armoring that exists either with sea walls like this one at um, uh, Sandy Cove or um, uh, uh, port walls or um, railway embankments and, and the like. So um, we're looking at a squeeze of the intertidal area and it's, it means essentially loss of habitat for birds and other animals. So maybe one to finish on a more positive note, uh, Dublin Bay has been designated as a biosphere and you might wonder what that strange scientific word means. Uh, technically, it just means um, a place with biological diversity, high biological diversity that is also used by large numbers of people. And the purpose of the biosphere, which is, I guess, managed by the three um, relevant local authorities in association with Dublin Port um, Company, um, the National Parks and Wildlife Service, and I think Fulcher Ireland are involved as well, um, is to try and promote a balance between people and nature here. It has a core of natural areas, most of which have other designations and protections as well, like the Bull Island, and then a buffer of kind of modified habitats along the shoreline and around the coast, which are um, used, of course, heavily used for other purposes, but um, uh, also have some nature interest and have a role in buffering the wilder areas. So just quick to finish on a point of just to remind us that nature isn't just there as a pretty background picture. It's important because it provides open space. It provides clean air and water for our recreation and for, for various other purposes. Um, and importantly, um, all of the plants and animals are indicators of, of the health of the environment. And so it's really vital that we um, keep those complex um, ecosystems intact and, and don't, uh, don't overstress them because um, if we start to do that, then we unbalance the whole system. So thank you very much. I hope that is of some interest to, to people. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for a very informative and entertaining talk. It reminds me that uh, Dublin Bay belongs to a lot more than just uh, the human race. And uh, we should share it uh, with that in the back of our mind. And uh, I'd say that uh, we'll have a lot of questions for you later on. And thank you very much once again. Yeah. Okay, I'm happy to take questions if anybody has any, but um, I'm tempted to say read the book. And uh, having done that, you can ask me questions. Richard, uh, if I just might ask you, um, of all of the, uh, the boards that we're familiar with, uh, no, no difficult questions now, Cormac. No, no, I, I just often wondered about the migratory habits of the, many of the boards. Uh, they're not all the same. Uh, the type of wading boards, particularly, that you might see uh, out on the coastline. Mm -hmm. uh, just wonder what sort of percentage of them are actually migratory, and do many of them actually oh, stay? The vast uh, majority are migrants. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but uh, people. Uh, would be aware that in winter months uh, the numbers are swelled by very large numbers coming in from the arctic uh, regions uh, where they breed but we also overlook the fact that a, a number of them stay the whole year as well so there can be several thousand oyster catchers in the bay right through the summer for instance and these would be birds which don't breed at all they're probably non-breeders uh, surplus to the breeding population they might be immature birds quite a few immatures that haven't if you like, <clears throat> paired up and, and, and gone off to breed. And then we have a few breeding birds. We have 
um, you know, uh, birds like local birds like um, ring plovers that would nest on sandy shores north and south of the bay, not so much in the bay because of the amount of disturbance on the beaches. Um, but yeah, I mean, and then in the autumn and uh, spring, when it's a sort of changeover time between winter and summer, then there's, you know, a big influx of stuff coming in, a lot of which doesn't stay very long, maybe only stops for a day or two to feed up and move on. Um, and some of them might be going from West Africa to, to Iceland to breed, you know, and they just stop in Dublin Bay for a, a few hours, even, even just one tide and pack in a few worms and shellfish and then head on. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned the uh, the Corlews, and it's very, very tragic to actually see something like that happening in front of your eyes, because my own group noticed it uh, from back about in 1970, when huge flocks of Corlews used to come in into the fields around where I live. And gradually over the years, that seemed to just diminish uh, until eventually they didn't come at all. And it's terrible to see something like that happening. Uh, I know for a number of reasons, probably from... Uh, changes of habitat and so forth. Uh, you can also, you also mentioned the mackerel. I've seen that uh, time, you know, over the years that they'll be they're coming in later, fewer and smaller. Yeah. And from over exploitation. Yeah. Well, I, I, I congratulate on a wonderful talk tonight. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Yeah. The, it's a great, great talk. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. I realized they all connected. But the collapse in insect life, fish life, bird life in nature, which is the more marked? Which is leading it? And how much trouble are we in? Uh, read David Attenborough to get a kind of an overview of the situation um, in very readable terms. He's uh, produced a, a really good book called um, My Life on the Planet, I think. Not too sure of uh, the title. Um, it's difficult really to make comparisons like that, Ed, because, um, you know, first of all, information is limited. Um, you know, not everything is monitored exactly. Um, and particularly in Ireland, uh, where we're largely dependent on, you know, a handful of scientists and, and then volunteer recorders and so on. So for certain groups like birds, we know an awful lot because um, you know, there are plenty of bird watchers and, and they contribute a lot of information over decades. Uh, we've, for example, the wintering um, wild owl and, and, and waders in Dublin Bay have been monitored since the 1960s um, on a more or less continuous basis. And so we can see the, the rise and fall and certain things, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. Certain species are actually doing quite well. The Brent geese, for instance, have increased markedly over the decades. Um, the um, black-tailed godwit, which I showed, I think, in some of my slides, um, have increased substantially. Um, but others, like the curlews you mentioned, have, have gone downhill. And, and that's happened right across Europe. It's not just in Ireland. Um, and a lot of that has to do with changes in land use practices in the hills, uh, increased amount of forestry, for instance, um, covering up open areas of hillsides, which they used to nest on, increasing number of predators as a result, living in the forest, coming out and, and, and predating the nests. So the curlew is a bit of a, a, a case that is often misunderstood because if you go out to, let's say the Bull Island at high tide, you'll see hundreds and hundreds of curlews uh, roosting on the shoreline. Uh, but those curlews didn't breed in Ireland. They came from places like Norway and Scotland and, and other places. Um, it's the breeding ones in Ireland in the summer that have declined massively. And we're down to maybe 100 or 200 pairs now, whereas it was thousands at one stage. But in winter, you will see still quite large numbers coming into the country and particularly into Dublin Bay. In relation to the uh, curlew, I, uh, in a previous life, was a game dealer, huh. and uh, <laughs> I apologise. That's okay. Uh, yeah, we had um, we always had, we always had a load of shooters would cut the whole lot. But I had yeah. one lad down in Dungarvan, and he came to me this day and he said, "Look, uh, do you think anybody might be interested in Corlew?" Hmm. And I said, "Yeah, of course." Right. Can you give put a year on that? Uh, can you yeah, can well, you say when uh, that would have been? 
it was legal. I didn't know it at the time, but he, he got me half a dozen corley and I gave them into one of the restaurants here in Dublin. Really? Yeah. Um, and did they... Two um, days later, he, he rang me and said, oh, he says, they were fantastic. He went down a, a, a treat. Can you get me more? Be beaks and all. I says, I'll, I'll, ring, yeah. I'll ring him and see if he can get more. So I rang him and says, this customer is looking for more. Can you get me a dozen or two? And he says, yeah. He says, I'll be going out next week and uh, I'll have a, have a go at it. And uh, about uh, two days later, I get a phone call from the, uh, the restaurant. Oh, he says, we're in deep doo-doo. I says, why? He says, Corlew, he says, they're protected, protected species. <laughs> he says, well, you didn't get them off me. <laughs> he said, uh, well, I didn't say I got them off you. He said, I just got them off, off a friend of mine. So I yeah. said, well, look, we won't be doing them anymore. So I yeah. rang the, the hunter and I said, uh, Tony, I says, uh, that was Corlew, they're on the protected list. Oh, I didn't know that. I says, mm. well, you should have known it. You nearly got me in trouble. But however, I was mm. only a half dozen. So I'm not responsible for the rest of them. Would you Would you care to put a year on that when uh, when it happened? Yeah, that was. I'll tell you when that was. That was about 1985. Really, as recent as that, yeah. Because yeah. they've been protected well, I have a friend. since the 70s um, under the Wildlife Act. Yeah. 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 Uh, about 1985. Mm. Yeah, Richard. I have a friend who who lives and grew up on the Essex salt marshes and the Walton backwaters. And when he came back from school as a child, he would just go out shooting and they ate everything. And he mm. said, curlews were shite. He said, Ed, don't put any, any bird where the recipe begins with sticking an onion up its ass, don't bother. <laughs> and, and the curlew counts as that. And yeah. one of the climactic scenes of a great novel called Mahala, which is Wuthering Heights with Mud. It is the, the great romantic novel of the Essex salt marshes, involves the villain of the piece trying to seduce the heroine of the piece. The final would-be pillow gift is a brace of curlew tied together by the neck. She spurns even that. And there's this wonderful written image of the curlews with their necks and their beaks uh, lying in the mud uh, in the dike as she, as, she, as she rejects him again. <laughs> wonderful story. Yeah, fiction, I presume. Mahara is fiction, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the story, the story about the, uh, the, 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 the man in the, in the Essex marshes is true. Um, and ate everything. And indeed, it was on, in Essex where they shot the last flamingo in England. In fact, it may be the only flamingo that was shot in England on Bridgemarsh Island. Um, the, there's a photo from the 1910s of some very grisly... Uh, um, 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 marsh man with a flamingo that flew by or landed was foolish enough to land in Essex and what do you do what do you, you shoot it don't you and he's yeah. standing there with his flamingo yeah so, <laughs> poor bird from the zoo. <laughs> they better stay in the zoo yeah yeah Be safer, safer there <laughs> R Richard we've got a question from Miles Reed about um, whether the proposed wind farms mm -hmm. are a threat to bird life I thought that might come up. Um, the proposed wind farms have been proposed for at least two decades and uh, they're still proposed. But um, yeah, they're, they're likely to be fast tracked now because of the, um, you know, the major push to try and um, transfer on from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And the offshore wind farms offer the best uh, hope for this because we've really already occupied most of the land onshore land sites for wind farms in the west of Ireland and, and there's really very few sites left. So um, most of these uh, offshore ones are going to be located on the banks uh, from the southern end of the Kish Bank south uh, through the Codling Bank, the India Bank and, and, the Arc and of course the Arklo Bank already has seven turbines on it, has done for decades now um, but the, the 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 ones that are coming are going to be hundreds of turbines and these are big modern turbines that are up to 150 meters high above the water le water level so they are substantial um, and they could be a, a certain amount of uh, a hazard to flying birds but particularly in poor weather, uh, in, in weather like fog that we sometimes get in Dublin Bay when visibility is down to, you know, a few yards, um, which hopefully won't occur too much. But um, it should be remembered that 
the vast majority of birds, when they're moving through the bay, they're flying quite low um, near the surface of the sea, um, with one or two exceptions. Um, the gannets will rise up when they're when they're hunting and drop down vertically into the water. But when they're in passage, when they're flying through, say backwards and forwards from feeding areas to nesting areas like Carlin's Eye, um, they they fly just at wave height virtually um, because they get an uplift from the waves as the uh, air passes over the wave. It it, it gives them an uplift, um, and uh, these turbines are turning. You know the the lowest part of the tip of the blade is at about 50 meters above sea level. So, um, you know, there's a huge gap underneath that birds can pass through. Um, but most of the studies that have been done in, in the UK and in other parts of Europe have, have showed that uh, by and large, the seabirds will avoid, um, avoid the turbines. They fly between them. They can see them, they can sense them, they can hear the sound of the, the rotors um, and, and they literally avoid them just the same way they would avoid hitting the uh, pigeon house chimneys, you know, uh, because they're large, uh, tall structures um, and they just literally fly around them or between them. So uh, I think uh, like by comparison with uh, things like, um, you know, water pollution or um, uh, habitat loss, um, the, the potential uh, of, of wind turbines at sea to do damage to bird life is, is pretty small. Uh, admittedly, occasionally birds will be killed in, in bad weather conditions, but um, they're also probably lost at sea as well in bad weather conditions. Um, so I'm not, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but uh, you know, I think the threat that climate change um, uh, brings with it to the natural world as well as to ourselves uh, has, to be, has to be met and has to be recognized and uh, if we have to sacrifice something, um, it's well worth uh, transferring over to renewable energy sources. I was going to, I was going to ask um, about sort of any, any more exotic birds. I mean, I've, I've clearly read this uh, from cover to cover, but uh, <laughs> um, like sort of, uh, I can't remember the name of them, but I've seen in the Psalm Estuary, um, the sort of um, duck build whatever not, they're called. Not the platypus. No, not the no. platypus, no. no. <laughs> um, we do get um, what are known as sawbills, which are um, mergansers in Dublin Bay. I, I don't know if that's what you mean, but um, they are fish feeding ducks, um, which are, I suppose it's unusual among ducks to be catching fish, but they have, they have um, sort of serrations on the bill, which they can use to catch fish and they dive just like cormorants. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there are lots of rare birds uh, as well that come to the bay, but, um, uh, you know, I, I think I'm much more interested in the ecology of the common species um, uh, and how they interact with the with their environment and with, with all the, the other huge range of sort of marine um, animals and plants. Uh, rare species don't interest me very much um, because a lot of, in a lot of cases, they're just they're just vagrants, things that have uh, come by accident and, and, and won't be seen again for a while. Yeah, I was going to ask a, a, another question, um, if I'm not- No, you're only allowed one. Sorry, hogging Mike. the floor, um, yeah. which is sort of outside of the Dublin Bay area and further, further down the East Coast. Um, and there's been a lot of threat to the, the railway line um, yeah. all the way down there. I mean, is, is, is anything happening with regard to either deciding, you know, they're going to move the railway further inland or or protect the railway line where it currently is. Mm. No, quite the reverse. Um, uh, Irish Rail uh, are simply putting in big, bigger and bigger and bigger piles of boulders to try yeah. and uh, repel the sea. But it's really like um, uh, King Canute um, hoping that they can he can stop the tide. Um, eventually that uh, barrier, which we know is the Murrah between uh, Greystones and, and Wicklow is going to be breached, uh, probably not in our lifetimes, but um, <clears throat> certainly in the foreseeable future. And um, essentially the railway will have to be moved at that point um, because there are times when the waves break over it. Um, and uh, indeed when the, when the line has to be closed, 
So, and, and I think that happens as well in Dublin Bay with the, with the dark line. I'm sure a, a number of people will know that. Um, yeah, I so, mean, it's, yeah, a, it's, I mean, it's, the it's a stun- is not good. It's a stunning journey um, uh, while it lasts, um, particularly breaking out there um, as you head south. Um, I think at Kalini, you, you come out of the headland the tunnels, there. Out of the tunnels, and suddenly, yeah. boom, yeah. you get the, the, the yeah. view of... Uh, it's one of the most spec- spectacular coastal rail trips in the world, I think, that, that yeah. bay no, it's, and it's around stunning, yeah. Brayhead and so on. So, But we're straying out of Dublin there into County Wicklow, so we better be careful. Yes, apologies, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. That was really, really great. It's always very moving the, the notion of nature, 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 cheek by jowl with the city as well. We've plenty to think about next time we're out in the bay and uh, things to look out for. So thank you very much again, uh, Richard, and look forward to seeing you all next week. Yeah, great talk, Richard. Okay. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. thank you. Thank you, Richard. Great thank talk. Thank you. Mm.